Okay. Hello to you both near and far, and welcome to our first ever experiment in hybrid in-person and online programming. I can't think of a more joyful occasion to inaugurate this experiment than a program honoring the generous, generative, and endlessly inventive spirit of John Ashbery. Our event today stars biographer Karen Rothman and poet and editor Emily Skillings, who will be providing deeper context to John's relationship to this instrument and extending its possibilities and chance operations to you through a range of exercises, the grand finale of which will involve the use of the typewriter by those in the room and uh, the promise that thanks to John's husband, David Kermani, this typewriter is here to stay. And we hope that it will form a continued site for imagination, transformation, provocation, and conversation. I'm starting to sound like Arlo Guthrie here. Um, <laughs> for those who aren't familiar with the Poetry Room, we have a long and evolving history with John since he first arrived on campus in 1945 and became, according to Karen, a constant presence in the Poetry Room, which was then located in Widener Library. Uh, he immersed in our literary recordings, checked out books by Auden, even garnering the late notice you'll have in your packet, and I think Mary's going to share that online, a, a typed mea culpa from him, uh, circa 1946. And it was at the Poetry Room that John was offered his first ever poetry reading in or around 1947, as Karen helped us discover. After graduating, we were honored to make the first recording of his work in 1951, and subsequently recorded him almost every decade thereafter. And at his death, his husband David generously donated the contents of his inimitable reading library, comprised of over 5,000 books, and his typewriter to the Poetry Room. The books join Ashbery's papers at our mother ship, Houghton Library. The curator of John's archive has kindly uh, joined us today. Um, thanks, Leslie, for your steadfast dedication to John's legacy. Sorry. <laughs> I'm outing her in the room. Um, given Ashbury's early immersion in our audio archive, it gives me great pleasure to use this occasion today to announce that we will be launching a collaboration with Phonograph Records next fall with the release of a vinyl disc of a recording of Ashbury's 1976 reading at Harvard. The second LP to be pressed in that series will be Audre Lorde's 1970 Poetry Room Studio recording, and the list goes on. Um, and speaking of record players, the last thing I want to say was, as you probably know, the Poetry Room is one of the largest um, collections of literary recordings in the United States, and there's something particularly powerful, at least to me, in the bringing together into a single room the typewriter and the record player. The typewriter and the phonograph uh, were invented within about 10 years of each other in the 19th century, and in many ways, these two instruments combined to catalyze some of the greatest literary innovations and cultural and political revolutions of the 20th century. And now, let's see what we can do for the 21st. Please welcome Karen Rothman and Emily Skilling. Well, uh, I'm going to start this event today, and then Emily's going to take it over um, in about 20 minutes. And uh, I'm thrilled to be here and really appreciative of the work that um, Christina Davis and, and Mary Graham and Leslie Morris have done to um, have so much amazing uh, Ashbury materials available um, here at Harvard. So uh, I was asked to talk about... Um, the scope of Ashbery and the typewriter and sort of how he used it and thought about it through his career, which is a fun thing to talk about, um, to think about this one object and how it um, helped him think about writing and changed his writing at various points. Um, and I thought I would start with a power, I have a PowerPoint um, that I want to share with you with some quotations on it. But you all have the printout of the screen. Oh, uh, yeah, there for the in-person audience. <laughs> um, so let me just read this. This is uh, an un unpublished note that he wrote um, on his rituals of writing. He was going to give it to, to a, um, a book, but um, decided instead that he didn't want to make statements about writing. And you'll see why. This is part of a longer piece. Um, but he wrote, I find I compose best on an old, reconditioned royal office model typewriter bought in one of those dreary secondhand office furniture stores on West 23rd Street. Very heavy, Sphinx typewriter paper works best, and it should be treated with a minimum of respect, crude penciled in corrections, etc. He wrote this in, in 1977. So this, this kind of both sincere and arch um, quotation, I think, 
helps us think about um, uh, Ashbery and, and the typewriter, the way he is reveling in the physical details of the typewriter and at the same time has a kind of enthusiasm about it. Um, the heaviness of the type of the paper and the typewriter itself, um, and and the combination of the old reconditioned typewriter with the newness of the composition that he's creating. Um, we see this uh, this combination of things working through his um, his poetry from the beginning and his thinking about the typewriter in relation to his poetry. So uh, the the next um, panel is. Uh, a very early, it's his very early po is its earliest poem when he was eight. Um, and let me just read you like a little piece that I think is related to the typewriter. Um, the battle's beginning, it's a fight to the end, the rabbits pitch in, some help they must lend, the bushes are conquered, well, that was short. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this, this is like a little piece from this poem called The Battle, and uh, he typed it, actually. Um, he, he typed it on his grandfather's old Remington typewriter, and he didn't know how to type. So I see part of the, um, the, the poem itself is about a battle between trees and bushes, and, I see p and he turned it into this kind of epic thing. And so I see part of um, the uh, well that was short as a way of not having to write out the whole battle, um, because he actually uh, couldn't, couldn't do it yet. Um, so uh, in, terms of his, in, in terms of his skills uh, in, in, type, in typing. Um, and the typewriter paper box uh, that, that's there um, is one that uh, he put all his early uh, poems and uh, short stories in and kept it in that box so that it was still in his Hudson house um, uh, many, many years later. And it says on it, early literary attempts very private, which is something that he wrote on it in high school. And it represents um, things that he had written sort of before then. Um, and then the next uh, panel is, is, I think, an interesting one. Um, is, this is the last page of a diary he kept for four years. He kept four diaries um, in early years. Uh, so this was in high school. In 1944, he's at Deerfield and far away from home, um, has been handwriting the diary and handwriting all his poems. And he announces at the very end of this diary, I shall rent Brute's typewriter tomorrow. I will write better poems than I ever have and publish them. <laughs> and um, and I, I'm really fascinated by the idea that his sense of himself as having a career as a poet and his sense that he needed to start typing um, are, are combined here. And so there's this sense that, that he really needs to see what poems look like, the way they look like a poem in a book, um, to sort of think of himself in that, in that way into the future. So uh, um, the next page is, is uh, I wanted to put in um, something about the pleasure of typos, like how much pleasure he, he got from um, including typos and then started to make typos, create typos, as part of the way the typewriter helped him think about um, or helped him be uh, innovative, um, first accidentally and then, and then the, the joy and delight that he took um, with some of the things that happened um, by accident. So the, the first one is actually something that happened um, while he was handwriting um, in his diary, in an early diary. I got a painful scratch on the writer, pardon, listening to the radio, I mean scratch on the finger. And that was a, a source of real delight to sort of make mistakes like that. Um, and, and this way of, of thinking about um, mistakes as pleasures um, is something that he shared with his all with his friends and their letters back and forth to each other, um, you know, have a ton of these kinds of accidents that are um, quite magical in them. So in a letter from Kenneth Koch to John Ashbery in 1960, uh, Kenneth Koch writes, seems to me your poetry's been going in this direction of Europe for years, especially lately, but gish, you did it. I mean, gosh, gish, wow, help. <laughs> It's wonderful. It's that repetition of gish, which is a better word than gosh, and is funnier um, that, uh, that that is the kind of the energy of the letter um, and where you get really the feeling of, of um, his excitement at uh, Ashbury's um, breakthrough poem. The next, I have two more typos that I included. 
One is um, from Ashbury in a letter to Frank O'Hara. Um, he wrote, he still seems to be carrying the porch for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and that one is one that he liked so much that he kept repeating it in other letters. So you see the porch used instead of the torch a lot. And uh, the last one is in a letter that Ashbury wrote to Harry Matthews. It's a little bit of a, of a different kind. He, he writes, Dear Lu Wow, I meant to address this thusly from Hawaii, but was there barely long enough to send a postcard. Because one of the things that the typewriter enabled him to do was start to see words more clearly as made up of many parts of words. And so in the poem Idaho that I'll talk about in just a second, he, one of the things that he does is he turns the word lowered into low red. Um, and so he, he, he uses uh, the typewriter in a way to sort of start to make up um, new versions of old words. So the next one. Uh, so he, he was a, a not a good typist until he started working in an office in uh, New York City. Um, when he graduated from Harvard in 1949, he went straight to New York and got a job at uh, Oxford University Press, and then he got a job at McGraw-Hill after. And this poem, the instruction manual, um, he wanted to write at the office um, because he had a royal typewriter at the office. And he had, by that point, he had his own typewriter, but he had an Olivetti, and he didn't like it as much. So he purposefully wrote this at the office. And he would say that in letters to friends, well, they don't know what I'm typing as long as I am typing. So. Um, <laughs> So he wrote this at, at McGraw-Hill, and the first line of it is, um, as I sit looking out of the window of the building, so there's this sense of dreaming, and there's a kind of way that the typewriter itself becomes part of this, that sort of meditative clicking sound um, becomes part of his ability to turn away from the work that he's supposed to be doing in this poem, the instruction manual, and turn towards um, the work that he wants to be doing, which is the work of dreaming. Um, the next one. Oh, that's the whole poem there. And oh, one more thing that you see about that actually is the long lines. And the, the better he got at typing, the longer his lines got. Uh, so the last two slides are two poems um, that he wrote during the period in which he was in, uh, had moved to, to Paris. Um, at, uh, in 1955, he got a Fulbright and moved there. And um, over the next 10 years, he, his poetry became really innovative um, in, in all new ways. And I have this like enduring image of, of Ashbury in Europe with a suitcase in one hand and a typewriting suitcase in the other, sort of balancing it out. This is before we all figured out that wheels were really um, so, so in, in Idaho, um, he includes the symbols in the poem. And the interesting thing about this poem, Idaho, was that it, when it was first published in Locus Solis, which was a magazine he started with Harry Matthews, um, the sim, one of the symbols before part two starts is a slash mark. And when it's published in the Tennis Court Oath, in, in, uh, when the, the poem is published as the last poem in the Tennis Court Oath in 1962, it's a pound sign. Um, so he was actually at the mercy of the machines that were available. Um, so when Locus Solus was set, uh, typeset, I think they didn't have a pound sign. So that's part of the reason that the symbol had to change. And, and finally, I wanted to talk just briefly about The Skaters, which is uh, a long poem that he first published in the magazine that he started with some other friends um, in 1963. And this poem was first published there in 1964. And uh, it starts with this word, with this phrase, these decibels. And I, I hear in these decibels, in part, um, the, the sound of the typewriter. This, one of the things he said about writing the skaters was that the lines were so long, he had to write this poem on a typewriter. He couldn't handwrite it. He had been doing like a little bit of both, depending on where he was. He had a notebook that he sometimes hand wrote in. But by the time he wrote the skaters, he absolutely had to use a typewriter because it was he could type really quickly by then. He was an art critic by then and typing articles every week. And he was so fast at, at, as a typist that he could get to the end of the thought much faster on a typewriter. The lines are incredibly long um, in, in, in the skaters. So that's my segue to our little writing exercise now. 
Um, the segue is actually ice skating. Um, <laughs> so the, the poem that we're going to talk about a little bit, the, the exercise we're going to do, um, points back to this poem, The Skaters, in a funny way. It's about as tiny uh, a, a poem about skating as The Skaters is a, a very, very long one. So if you turn to the, yeah, to the next page, there, it's a, the way we're going to do it first is by just talking about three making up your own three noun phrases. Um, so there are three noun phrases in the poem that we're going to rewrite. Uh, the phrase, the first one is the leftover duck. The second one is the kissing. And the third one is ice skating. And so the three, the qualities of these three noun phrases are all different. The first one is an adjectival phrase. Um, and the second one is uh, gerund, so it has the quality of, of a verb in it, um, and it has that dynamic energy of a verb um, that, uh, that a gerund can bring into a sentence. And the last one is also a gerund, but it's an uncountable noun, so it has no article. Um, so it's, it's a, a noun that, that, you don't, that, you, that you don't count. Um, so I, I wanted to help you think about what kinds of phrases you're going to make. You're going to make one adjectival phrase, one uh, gerund phrase, and one uncountable noun phrase. You're going to come up with your own um, by giving you some cutouts. And uh, these are cutouts that actually that belong to Ashbury. And in the next slide, you'll see here are some that I just picked a few from his pile of many. Um, and you can see actually in the one at the top right that he cut out some of them. These are just kind of ordinary things or ads or pictures from magazines that he, um, that, that interested him and that he cut out and, and used. And I want you to use these. You don't have to, to use these, but, but I wanted you to have them as um, provocations for uh, writing, writing some nouns, noun phrases. So I'm going to give you about a minute and a half now to come up with a couple and just make a list. You can do it on that page um, or at home just on a, any scrap of paper and, and come up with a couple of uh, three, three noun phrases, one adjectival, one gerund, and one uncountable gerund. Okay, 10 more seconds. Okay. Do all of you have three? Did you come up with three? All right. Um, so if we turn the page now, I wanted to share his poem. This is Ashbury's own poem where he uses these three noun phrases. Um, can we all read this out loud and for the Zoom audience, um, read it 
to yourselves as well. Let's read it like three times in a row because it's so super short. Um, okay, ready? Who will, Who will do, do the, the kissing? kissing? You, you will, will not have, have heard that. that. What, what about, about the leftover, leftover duck? duck? Who, Who will, do, will the do the kissing? They, they have gone ice skating. skating. Again. Who will do, Who will the, do kissing? the kissing? You, you will not, not have heard that. that. What, what about the leftover duck? duck? Who, Who will do, do the kissing? kissing? They, they have gone ice skating. skating. Last time. Who, Who will do the kissing? kissing? You will not have heard that. that. What about the leftover duck? Who will do the kissing? They have gone ice skating. Okay, so um, here's the poem itself uh, on the next slide. And you can put your own uh, three phrases in it. So the fun thing about uh, these three phrases is that the third line, who will do the kissing, becomes your title. So whatever gerund phrase you picked for that um, So, does anybody want to share the poem that you came up with? Yeah. Share. Um, Hang on. Oh, here's I'm the sorry. mic. <laughs> I got distracted writing. Okay. Who was who was you? Oh, just introduce myself. Or just to <laughs> I'll just read. That will be my introduction. Um, who will do? The confiscating. <laughs> you will not have heard that. What about the frayed shoelace? Who will do the confiscating? They have gone yawning. Oh, I love that. Does anybody else want to share? And you can put it in the chat too. Yeah? No? Um, there'll be time later as well. Um, so the last slide that I have is that I wanted to give you a little background on this um, little exercise, this mini exercise. Um, Ashbury uh, liked to, to, well, first of all, here are two, two collages that he made. And I picked these two collages, Notre Dame des Neiges and Still Life with Grapes, because these are, two, these are collages that only have two parts. Um, so many of his collages have many, many parts. but. These are, are, look complicated, but they actually only have, are made up of two parts. The first one is a postcard that Maxine Grofsky sent to Ashbury that he added a depiction of St. Mary onto. And the second one is um, a Parmigianino's um, self-portrait in a convex mirror uh, with Caravaggio's Bacchus Ailing on, on top, piece of it on top. So, um, so the, and the exercise itself is what I'm calling, he didn't have a name for it, what I'm calling parts to a whole exercise. That is um, an exercise that he gave his students where he just cut, gave them cutouts himself. And then they, he asked them to create a poem out of, the, out of just using those cutouts. And the question, um, since I've been interviewing a lot of his students, one, one of the questions that that exercise gave them was, are what what matters, the parts or the whole? Like how do you keep the parts themselves um, visible and, and central to the poem so that each part has a piece? Or do you try to cover over those parts and create a kind of whole? And is it possible to do both? So that's where this exercise comes from, um, is, is, the, is that idea of thinking about how to um, work out that relationship. All right, so now I'm going to hand this over to... Emily Skillings. <laughs> that was so amazing, Karen. I re actually remember when Ashbury got the catalog in the mail of those like Land's End <laughs> catalogs with the kind of like crotches, <laughs> the cropped <laughs> chinos. Um, so thanks so much again um, to Christina and Mary and Jeff and Leslie. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to be in the room with this object again and so thrilled that Harvard students will be able to write poems on it. It gives me like a really warm, fuzzy feeling thinking about people creating on poetry on this object, um, an object that I have a connection to. Um, the first time I met Ashbury, actually, oh, well, I didn't meet him, um, I went into interview 
interview for the job as his assistant. I was his assistant from 2010 to 2017, and I went to interview with his husband, David Kermani, and Kermani told me, oh, well, you won't be meeting Ash Mr. Ashbury today because he's in the other room typing his preface to Rambo his translation of Rambo's Illuminations. And so I heard this typewriter kind of in the next room, and it was a kind of larger-than-life experience. It, it was actually a very intimidating <laughs> experience. Of course, then when I met John, he was this, you know, the sweetest, most lovely person. And um, but just hearing the kind of clicking of the typewriter in the next room was a really wonderful kind of first introduction, non-introduction, introduction. introduction. Um, I also used to kind of sneak in in the morning and see what was written on the typewriter <laughs> because often he would write. Um, the days I wasn't there or, you know, after I had left. Um, and so I love to kind of go in and peek at what was there. So it's nice to see it again. Um, Christina actually made the discovery that um, there's no exclamation point on this typewriter. And I and when I think back on it, you know, I just actually finished editing a book of some of um, Ashbery's later um, unfinished longer works. And uh, I, I went back and was looking at the manuscripts and he had to write in the exclamation points. <laughs> and so thinking about that, Karen and I were talking about it earlier, like having to be really purposeful with that mark, right? If it's not available to you, like you have to really want it there, right? Um, so that was a kind of lovely discovery. <laughs> um, and I was surprised I hadn't realized it before. Um, so this typewriter has been on my mind a lot, actually, as I was editing this, this book, um, I would often encounter typos and have to kind of think about whether or not they were intentional. Um, there was a moment in the final manuscript, which is a long piece called The Kane Richmond Project, where Ashbery had written a word that looked like a kind of Frankenstein between impatient and omnipotent. And even Ashbury didn't know what it said. He had written next to it, impatient question mark, omnipotent question mark, and didn't make a choice. And I was like, uh. So I like put the words up on my wall. <laughs> and I was like, which one? Which one is it? And I had to think about the arrangement of the keys on the typewriter, right? Which were the letters that would have split? I think I went with impatient, <laughs> um, contextually, um, but, but om omnipotent would have been great too. Um, so I was thinking about the keys. There was another part um, where there's an image of a spider plummeting into this kind of hole. And just at, as it is at the point, O-T, o -T, hopening, H-O-P-E-N-I-N-G. And I had to think of whether that was of happening or of opening, and they were both so good. <laughs> um, and then I had to think about, well, you know, what was, and it was actually David Kermani who said, well, you have to think about the typewriter, what keys were next to each other. Mm -hmm. And it kind of was this moment that kind of um, really opened up editing for me. It was like thinking about the kind of materiality of the, of the, of the instrument. Um, so I, uh, I wanted to kind of start today moving into thinking kind of more about collage. These are not my notes. <laughs> um, and um, I wanted to start with this poem of Ashbery's um, from the Tennis Court Oath, They Dream Only of America. Um, it is a, a poem that I've loved for so long, and the reason I know I love it is because when I go to it, there's something I become obsessed with each time. So like for many years, like maybe in my 20s for many years, it was the lake, a lilac cube, which for me was the kind of like quintessential image of, of all poetry, like the lake, a lilac cube would just pop into my head. Like how amazing, the, like you can't even visualize it, right? And it, it really kind of, um, it became my definition of even a poem or an image for a long time. But now as I read it, um, I was talking with my friend, the poet Adam Fitzgerald the other day. Um, we were talking about this poem and he said uh, something about the elasticity of the pronouns in the poem. And that, and now I'm obsessed with that <laughs> in this poem. Um, 
I'll just read it out loud very quickly, but, you know, we move from they to he to we to I to you kind of seamlessly, and this is not a thing that you would typically do in a poem, right? I even, when I'm teaching, I advise my students to kind of keep their pronoun systems in order, right? Um, but but the, this poem has such elasticity of address, right? There's quotations. Um, so thinking about the movement of the pronouns through it. So um, they dream only of America. They dream only of America to be lost among the 13 million pillars of grass. This honey is delicious, though it burns the throat. And hiding from darkness and barns, they can be grown-ups now. And the murderer's ashtray is more easily the lake a lilac cube. He holds a key in his right hand. Please, he asked willingly. He is 30 years old. That was before. We could drive hundreds of miles at night through dandelions. When his headache grew worse, we stopped at a wire filling station. Now he cared only about signs. Was the cigar a sign? And what about the key? We went slowly into the bedroom. I would, have not broken, I would not have broken my leg if I had not fallen against the living room table. What is it to be back beside the bed? There is nothing to do for our liberation except wait in the horror of it, and I am lost without you. Even that last line, the, 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 the space between the I and the you is so great. And I just love the way this poem kind of moves through, moves through its pronoun system, right? It's a really kind of open system of pronouns. So then I started, there's actually a whole kind of book on Ashbury and pronouns called John Ashbury and You uh, by John Emile Vincent. So it's not, I mean, I'm being really reductive there, but he talks a lot about the pronoun you um, um, in, in the in the through this through the books, um, so then I was like thinking about pronouns, and that led me to Ashbery's book Planisphere, which I have a lot of personal connection to because it was the book that had just been published when I started working for Ashbery. So I was kind of like studying up on him, <laughs> and I was reading a lot of Planisphere, um, and there are two poems in that book um, that use that use anaphora and they use, which is the repetition of a word or a phrase at the beginning of a line. And they use anaphora of they, um, the pronoun they. Um, there are these two collage poems in that book. Um, and so the first one, um, they knew what they wanted is a collage of um, film titles from Leonard Maltin's film guides. There were these books. Ashbury had a lot of them. Um, they're actually here now. Um, they're here. Um, he had a lot of books on film, um, and and he had these film guides that had you know like the title, the date, a little mini synopsis. They're these really thick books. I just ordered some of them from a books for today for later. Um, you'll see, but. Um, what is so interesting about this, as you can see, he starts kind of alphabetically, right? Kind of going through, and then at some moments kind of abandons, abandons that. So it's interesting to think about how he was selecting the film titles, what order they went in. Some of them are alphabetical, some of them are not. So thinking about, you know, splicing things in, um, it's really interesting to think about what his process might have been for this. Um, and I was thinking about Ashbury and film so much while I was editing this book that I just finished, um, that just came out in the spring, because he had, there's the long poem, The Kane Richmond Project, which is thinking about film and seriality. It, it, it kind of splices between um, lineated verse and prose poem, which is actually really interesting to think about in terms of the typewriter, right? Um, going from these blocks of prose to more lineated um, passages. But that, that manuscript has so many references to film in it that I could not even find all of them. <laughs> they were everywhere. Um, and, and so I was kind of it's interesting to look at this poem now in relation to that. Um, I thought we would have, we would listen to Ashbury read it. We actually have a recording uh, that can, they knew what they wanted. This is a collage poem made up of, out of movie titles, which I lifted more or less as is from the index of 
one of uh, Raymond, uh, is it Raymond? Leonard Malton's movie guides, which I keep near the TV set, or set, the TV. <laughs> they knew what they wanted, which is the title of the movie, like the other titles. They all kissed the bride, they all laughed, they came from beyond space, they came by night, they came to a city, they came to blow up America, they came to rob Las Vegas, they dare not love, they died with their boots on, they shoot horses, don't they? They go boom, they got me covered, they flew alone, they gave him a gun, they just had to get married, they live, they loved life. They live by night, they drive by night, they knew Mr. Knight, they were expendable. They met in Argentina, they met in Bombay, they met in the dark, they might be giants. They, <laughs> they made me a fugitive, they made me a criminal, they only kill their masters, they shall have music. They were sisters, they still call me Bruce, they won't believe me, they won't forget. That's for John. <laughs> um, I love that they still call me Bruce. It's like, is there a, they, you know, is there a, they call me Bruce. Um, I love thinking about how this was put together, and I love thinking about how these um, titles all have kind of plots and actors behind them. They all kind of let us dip our toe into like a moment of, you know, maybe Americana or like thinking about, you know, what, you know, what would they knew Mr. Knight about, um, and and kind of bringing them into relation. It starts. It starts to kind of form something really interesting. I just want to just to um, keep an eye on the time. I want to move to default mode, um, which is also a collage poem, but not coming from um, a list poem, but not coming from the film guides. Um, and as you can see, he he's repeating this phrase: "They were living in America," which I think is a really interesting to th thing to think about, kind of politically in terms of place, but also starting to kind of like collect some energy around that pronoun they. What does the pronoun they do um, when it kind of, when it, it, it's repeated th this much? What, is a f what happens to a phrase when it's repeated? So maybe we can um, play this and look for this moment when Ashbery um, upends his own form, when he, when he breaks the form in the poem, because that's something I'm gonna ask you to do, so. Default mode. Uh, <clears throat> it's called Default Mode. They were living in America at another time. They were living in America for the FBI. They were living in America, shit wins. They were living in America on the border with Canada. They were living in America, further gone into teats. They were living in America, that was the only good one. They were living in America, that was the only good one. They were living in America who answers the phone and they were living in America deliriously. They were living in America sadly. They were living in America fictitiously. They were living in America wedged. They were living in America stole by starlight. They were living in America the mighty sun. They were living in America pandemically. They were living in America across from the Ritz Hotel. They were living in America getting their chops. They were living in America only for just one summer. They were living in America beside the lake. They were living in America for the defeatist troops. They were living in America for the pleasure of it all. They were living in America as well as can be expected. They were living in America as one grows passionately out of a love affair. They were living there every day. Does this donut remind you of a life preserver? They were living in America to remind you of me. They were living in America and a storm blew up suddenly. They were living in America extended terms of credit. They were living in America but it's all over. They were living in America as tissue paper is to a comb. They were living in America at fives and sixes. They were living in America the same old, same old. Um, so, uh, this, I, I love this poem so much, and um, it, it really made me think about this thing that poetry can do where it can teach you how to read it, 
and then teach you how to, and then, and then break that pattern. And it becomes this really surprising moment. That moment of, um, there are two moments in this poem that I think are these kind of really interesting ruptures. They were living in America. That was the only good one. They were living in America. That was the only good one. And the repetition of that was the only good one kind of, um, kind of, uh, it, it, it doesn't let there be a possibility of there being a good one because it's repeated, right? So if there's two good ones, there can only be one good one. Um, and then uh, this moment of enjambment in the sixth, between the sixth and seventh stanzas, they were living in America as one grows passionately out of a love affair. They were living there every day. Does this donut remind you of a life preserver? Um, so the, the kind of extension of that phrase, even rhythmically, sonically, becomes such a surprise in the poem, um, right? This thought that's kind of allowed to spill over, this question that's allowed to spill over. Um, and I, I, you know, reading it now, I think, you know, it creates a they, but it also creates a place. It creates a, a, an America, a sense of different Americas that I think is kind of interesting. Um, I just want to read one more poem. It's not by Ashbery. Um, it's by the poet uh, Harriet Mullen thinking about this, this word, this pronoun they and what it can do in a poem, inside a poem. And I was wondering if someone from the audience actually wanted to, um, the physical audience here would read it out loud. Um, it's from Mullen's 2002 book, Sleeping with the Dictionary. Great, thanks. Okay. Elliptical by Harriet Mullen. They just can't seem to. They should try harder, too. They ought to be more. We all wish they weren't so. They never. They always. Sometimes they. Once in a while, they. However, it is obvious that they, their overall tendency has been, the consequences of which have been. They don't appear to understand that. If only they would make an effort to. But we know how difficult it is for them too. Many of them remain unaware of. Some who should know better simply refuse to. Of course, their perspective has been limited by. On the other hand, they obviously feel entitled to. Certainly, we can't forget that they, nor can it be denied that they. We know that this has been an enormous impact on their Nevertheless, their behavior strikes us as our interactions, unfortunately, have been. Great, great, wonderful reading. Um, I'm just wondering, with regard to the, the repetition of they in each line, the use of the word they in this poem, I was wondering if anyone kind of noticed anything about what, it do, what happens to with they in this poem. Sorry to be like teacherly, <laughs> but I'm tired of hearing myself talk. Um, I don't know if this is really to do with the pronoun they, mm -hmm. but also in, in relation to the poem by Ashbury that we just read, I can't help but notice that, that in Ashbury's poem we have the day in the, in the in independent clauses, mm -hmm. so whatever gets changed always has to be this kind of independent clause. Where yes. in, in, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Whereas in this one, the they is in the dependent clause, right? So it's, yeah. it's the opposite, well, almost the opposite effect. Or maybe they do the same yeah. thing, where the they becomes something about this dependency and independence. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's such a lovely way of putting mm -hmm. that. Um, did anyone else think of anything I'll about be, they? I'll be notice any like Notice anything about the they in this poem or about the poem in general? Well, it moves from they to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's moving around inside. It has the it has the same repetition but it's kind of moving around inside the phrase. Um And maybe what maybe what we could I could ask what's not being said in this poem. You know, we have a title called elliptical. We have these ellipses which which means that that language is being cut out. From the chat, someone says alienation. 
alienation. That's such a great word. The, it, there's a real sense of like distancing and othering with the they here, right? M maybe even about a, like a community of people, right? There's this kind of um, it's a it's a kind of collage of subtexts of right, something that's underneath what's being said, right? Um, and so I think that can be really interesting to think about pronouns and, and identity as well, right? How they, how they bring people together and, and kind of move people um, apart. So I want to, I also included he, which is a great <laughs> Ashbery collage pronoun poem, not collage, list poem, um, where every line begins with he. But I digress. So I've given here, you here, I've taken Leonard Maltin's 1997 and 2015 movie guides and I've, I've extracted all of the film titles that begin with pronouns. We have he um, and her, we and our, they, and you'll notice some lines from Ashbery's poem in here. We have it, it's really fertile ground. Um, we have, and then I also, if you weren't in a pronoun mode, I, mood, I have here and night. So um, titles that, that repeat night. Um, and there are some real hidden gems in here, in, in these titles. And so I'm going to give you two choices of prompt, and we're just going to take five minutes. Um, so the first prompt, um, and you can choose between these two. They're on the, this last page. So the first prompt is that you can construct a list collage poem of no more than 10 lines using text from the list of film titles above. Um, I've selected film titles for the pronouns he, uh, she, he, they, we, it, and I've also included those other words. Um, and you might feel, feel inclined to mix pronouns and, you know, feel free, go ahead. You can also change the words around. Nobody will ever know if you, if you tweak the words. <laughs> um, um, and remember that you can create a form and then break it slightly, like how Ashbery puts they live, they loved life together on that line and they knew what they wanted after each title getting its own line previously. Um, play with a, having a moment of enjambment or one title spills between two or more lines. Um, and there's other things to think about in the prompt. The other prompt choice, if you're not in a collage mode, um, is to write a kind of pronoun anaphora poem where a pronoun appears in each line. Um, and so uh, we are gonna take just, just five minutes to write these poems. Um, so feel free to, to kind of hang out in the list of found language or to kind of go into your own um, language. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, so I'm just going to set this timer for five minutes. Behind you, you may hear some typing. Okay. So maybe finish up the line that you're on. If you didn't reach the end, that's fine. Um, does anyone want to share their poem? The title is, It Ain't Hey. <laughs> it happened tomorrow. It runs in my family. It all came true. It could happen to you. It's your move. It's my turn. It should happen. It happened one Christmas. It happened to Jane. The night Evelyn came out of the grave. <gasps> Whoa. 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 
Oh, that is great. I love It Happened Tomorrow. <laughs> Such an amazing title. Like, we should all go watch that. Um, that's, that's incredible. It's it like, do you know, send that to the New Yorker. <laughs> it's great. And, uh, and wait a year. <laughs> um, does anyone want to read a, another poem? It can also be one of the, the, other, one of the other poems that you wrote for Karen's prompt. Okay. Yeah. It grows on trees. It's in the year. It started in Naples. It seemed like a good idea at the time. It happens every spring. It happens on Fifth Avenue, night after night. We were strangers. He stayed for the night. It's a wonderful life. It's a wonderful world. It seemed like a good idea at the time. It's love again. Ah. Oh. That moment when you switch from I to it to we is so breathtaking. That was incredible. Um, and I love how the it change, it can change every time. Anyone else want to read? And people on Zoom, you can share your poems in the chat as well. I can share one. Okay, great. Yay! <laughs> the mic advantage. Your double life, she walked by night. It's alive, it's a lowercase i. <laughs> it runs in the family, we're the Millers. It runs in the family, we're the strangers. It started with Eve, they ran for our lives. Ah, oh. yeah. these are fantastic. So this is a, you know, get yourself a Leonard Maltin <laughs> movie guide. And you thank know. her for typing all those up manually. <laughs> well, it was funny because I, could, I realized I couldn't possibly type all of them, so I was dictating them to type. And it, was, it fe felt like I was reading a poem when I was doing that. Um, thank you so much for sharing those poems. They were great. Um, so we're going to ask questions now, right? This yeah. might be a great a time to open it up for a few questions. They can be about Ashbury. They can be about can be their anything. friendship with Ashbury. They can be about the typewriter. Well, they they can, <laughs> you can ask Leslie about his yeah. manuscripts, et cetera. You can ask her about Emily Dickinson, too, <laughs> and how those poems were typed up by uh, Mabel in this talk. Um, anyone? And if not, we... So Emily, I guess I'm just wondering, you worked for Ashbury for like five years? Se yeah, for almost seven years. Yeah. yeah, and I guess I'm just wondering how your work changed as you were working with his wow. text. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, something that being around John taught me is that language is ev like kind of everywhere, and if you kind of op if you attune yourself to it, you can really kind of constantly be saturating yourself in language, and not just language from from reading, from reading um, language, you know, overheard language. You know, um, John loved to watch the news <laughs> and, and movies, right? And so, and he, you know, he would read every anything from the Village Voice horoscopes. Uh, he used to read those to. To, he used to, you know, say, "Do you want to hear your horoscope uh, this week?" Um, and he would read Virgo, and he, then he would read his Leo. Um, and so, just this idea that 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 language is coming from everywhere, and that it's coming. There are these different registers of language that you can attune yourself to, right? From the, you know, from like reading a novel to watching the news, and that they can all be inside the poem together. Um, and that's what made him such a great person to be around too, right? Because he was constantly quoting things that I had, I, you know, I was like 21, I had no idea what he was talking about. Um, um, also, uh, transcribing the poems, the, the part I liked the most about editing this book, which was, was such an honor and a journey and a um, way of kind of being with him again after he passed, 
Um, the, the part I liked best was transcribing the poems from the, the manuscripts. It kind of felt like we were chatting in this way, and um, it reminded me, you know, I used to take dictation a lot as his assistant. I was a terrible typist talking about typing. I'm a hunt and pecker, so he would be like, he would be like talking to me, sometimes dictating in French, and I'd be like scrambling <laughs> to type things down. Um, and so transcribing the poems really felt like kind of being in the room with him again and it kind of reminded me of taking dictation. I was writing a poem while I was transcribing um, one of the longer poems in the book and I found it really influenced my own work just like having just typed things that he wrote. So yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay. Great. Any Zoom questions? Yeah. Well, um, I know a lot of people. Um, I was used to work at the Grolier Poetry Bookshop, and so people would come in and always ask about Ashbery, like, well, I don't get it. What, what, what's the deal? And that was just like a constant question. So I'm wondering, like, how you would answer that question. Um, because you <laughs> you knew him and like what's the deal? <laughs> you, well, like like yeah. how do I understand mm -hmm. Ashbery? I don't understand Ashbery was usually the question. Like um, you know, but because um, you're not going to understand John Ashbery the way you're going to try to understand Mary mm -hmm. Oliver or, or something like that. That's what that's yeah. the, you know what I mean by the question because I never knew how to answer the question. Um, that would be satisfactory. Yeah. Do you want to take this? <laughs> okay. sure. I mean, like the little exercise that we did. It's it's a kind of exercise that I do in my. I taught a class on on Ashbury and film and art and music last year, and the the exercises that we did in class were all always a, a version of a poem that he wrote, and the way. I thought about those exercises was about inhabiting the kind of thinking that he was engaging in in the poem. So like the, the question that I would want to ask about the exercise that we did was, what do you know now about how the poem works that you didn't know before? And, um, and one of the ways to do that actually, and, and the one of, I mean, I love Who Will Do the Kissing. I think it's like an endlessly fascinating and tiny poem. And I've done a bunch of different exercises with that particular poem and with other poems that feel like they don't make sense, but then there's actually such a structure that's upholding it. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, and, and it's in fact, one exercise that I did with students um, during the pandemic because we had to be outside for, if we were meeting together, was to do a kind of like an improv class where we would take one line and then the next person would try to not make sense. And it's actually really, really difficult to not make sense. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that, that I think about that difficulty is to try to make it more difficult. And, when, and, and, and part of that is then actually realizing like the incredible structure that we all share in terms of our understanding of grammar that's, that, that like hold, holds it together. Yeah. I, yeah, maybe we can pivot to the exercise. Sure, sure. Um, so we thought we would end with a kind of Frankenstein uh, prompt. <laughs> um, uh, oh, great. Um, inspired by the, you know, classic surrealist <laughs> um, exercise, the exquisite corpse, but also um, thinking about this um, form that, I, that um, I'm, I'm calling the unwilling centaur. And that phrase um, comes from a book by Jack Spicer uh, called After Lorca. And it is a book of translations, I'm using quotes, um, of Federico Garcia Lorca's poems. 
um, but, uh, but they're very creative translations. Um, and it also has an introduction and letters by Lorca in it, which is pretty funny because Lorca had been dead for 21 years when this book came out. Um, they're written by Spicer as Lorca. So like kind of writing um, through this figure. And L Lorca, AKA Spicer, in the introduction says this about the, the, the book, about after Lorca and the translations inside it. Um, it must be made clear at the start that these poems are not translations. And even the most liberal of them, Mr. Spicer seems to derive pleasure in inserting or substituting one or two words which completely change the mood and often the meaning of the poem I, as I had written it. More often, he takes one of my poems and adjoins to half of it another half of his own, giving it rather the effect of an unwilling centaur. Modesty forbids me to speculate which end of the animal is mine. And I think of this in relation to Ashbery, and Karen, you can, if you want to say anything else about this, um, because Ashbery was often like quoting others in his works, right? And so he would, you know, you know, stop in a poem. He would be writing his his own poem, and then he would, you like, just kind of insert a quotation by something else. So, what does it mean to kind of momentarily inhabit someone else's language during the the moment of composition? Um, so we thought we would we would put a um, some of Ashbery's language on this page, and then ask you to kind of contribute to it and to kind of keep the poem going as if you are now the author of it, this unwilling centaur. But I think John would be willing about it, <laughs> excited about it. And, and the poem that we picked to, to start um, is a poem that has a Harvard connection. It was a poem that he wrote when he was a senior in college here. And um, his roommate at the time, who has since passed away, unfortunately, um, was the one who related this, the story to me. Um, that they, their chairs were back to back, and so um, he was, they were working on their, what they thought were their homework, and Ashbury was scribbling away. Um, this is with pencil first, and, and he, it took about an hour, and he said, you want to see what I just wrote? And he handed the poem to his roommate, Bob Hunter, and Bob Hunter read it, and it was like, this is like the next level of your poetry. It was really uh, kind of thrilling. And it, it don't, I don't think also from this that, that it was just one hour because he had written like versions of this poem for many years actually leading up to this one hour. Um, and then he uh, typed it up uh, a little while later. So both the manuscript, the handwritten manuscript and the typed version, of which there are really only about two words that he changed um, to the version that ended up becoming the title poem for Some Trees. Um, a few years later, um, are, are here at, at Houghton. Um, and uh, so the first line of Some Trees is the line that is starting uh, this poem that you're all going to add a line to. Mm -hmm. Which, so, and the line is, yeah, it's a great line. Um, these are amazing, each. And so imagine that you wrote that line, mm -hmm. and then what would be the next line that you would write? <laughs> Um, and so people can come up and actually type it on the typewriter. We've yeah. set the tab to, and if you don't know how to advance it, the, the return carriage will show you how to do that. Um, and uh, for those at home, after you're finished writing, we'll post, we'll show you the original manuscripts uh, too, and we'll be handing out after you're done, so you don't see how the poem ends, um, uh, copies of these thanks to uh, Leslie Morris, who's allowed us to share these with you. So who's going to take the first? Um, yeah, do, does anyone want to come and add their line? <laughs> and typos are encouraged. Yes, typos are In fact, great. they're mandatory. It's not ergonomic, and it takes a lot of conviction with your fingers. Welcome to the 20th century. <laughs> and this would have been the past. I need to put this above uh, my desk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we, did, we could have put a chair <laughs> there, but we thought it was more reverent if you had to kneel before the time frame. <laughs> 
And just mess up how you return it and then try to find the tab button. And Um, thank you all for joining us. I think you know that this typewriter, we're, we're trying to brainstorm additional ways for people to use it. We have been allowing people to come uh, every Wednesday to reserve it uh, for several hours. Um, we're also inviting classes around Boston if they want to integrate it into their classroom to come here. We may try to install it in the Grolier if I can talk the library into letting me do that. Um, and if you want to uh, pitch a project or something that would meaningfully uh, use it. Um, we could certainly confer with you about that. Um, <laughs> uh, but I want to thank uh, Karen, without whom the typewriter would, would probably not be here, and Emily as well for their donations today. And may we all uh, abide in this world as John did. He was uh, one of the most generous men I've ever known, right? Yes. Now it's lovely to hear his voice. Yeah, it's yes. lovely yeah. to hear his voice again. I'm glad we clapped for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, and also thanks to David Kumani. Thanks, David. And I guess the next time we'll see you in terms of um, Ashbury is well, when we release the vinyl uh, <laughs> next year. Um, but our next event is an oral history of Anne Sexton's rock band. We'll be playing some recently digitized versions of the band's records, and um, meeting with uh, his, her daughter and the band's manager and some of the old band members. It's an amazing story, I think, that should, should um, go far and wide and inspire poets to start forming more bands. Mm -hmm. uh, James, you're in a band, right? Or you were? Formally. Formally, OK. We'll, we'll remove the formally adverb from your, from your resume. OK. Thank you all so much online. Thanks for bearing with us. We're just learning how to do this. So we're so grateful for your presence and your participation. We're going to play hearing one last dose of John. Paradoxes and oxymorons. This poem is concerned with language on a very plain level. Look at it talking to you. You look out a window or pretend to fidget. You have it, but you don't have it. You miss it, it misses you. You miss each other. The poem is sad because it wants to be yours and cannot be. What's a plain level? It is that and other things, bringing a system of them into play. Play? Well, actually, yes, but I consider play to be a deeper outside thing, a dreamed role pattern as in the division of grace, these long August days without proof, open-ended, and before you know it, it gets lost in the steam and chatter of typewriters. It has been played once more. I think you exist only to tease me into doing it on your level, and then you aren't there or have adopted a different attitude, and the poem has set me softly down beside you. The poem is you.